Europe in the 1990s had three important trends. One, the pressure on national economics increasingly caught up in global capitalism. Two, the defense of social achievement under attack. And three, the resurgence of nationalism and ethnic conflict. These trends took place in Russia, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, pressure on national economy caught up with global capitalism and further embraced a free market vision of a capitalist development. Examples of this were in Poland and Hungary, where they implemented market reforms and sought to create vibrant capitalist economies. Post-communist governments in Eastern Europe also freed prices, turned state enterprises over to private owners, and sought to move towards strong currencies and balanced budgets. When computers started to develop, they reduced the cost of distance, sped up communications, and helped businesses get cheaper labor overseas. Globalization, which is the emergence of a freer global economy, came about and sped up world economic growth. However, it had many negative social consequences. When Asia's financial crisis happened, people believed that it damaged both wealthy and poor countries, and it resulted in the demise of European communism and brought the triumph of liberal democracy. The resurgence of nationalism in the 1990s led to terrible tragedy and bloodshed in parts of e Eastern Europe and states that embraced national hatred and ethnic warfare became outlaws and were isolated by the European Union and international community. President Boris Yeltsin, his democratic supporters, and his economic ministers wanted to prevent a return to communism and also fix the faltering economy of Russia. Russian reformers used shock therapy, which freed prices on 90% of all Russian goods. It launched a rapid privatization of industry and turned thousands of factories and mines over to new private companies. Shock therapy backfired and increased prices 250% on the very first day. Meanwhile, Russian production fell 20%. Throughout 1995, inflation grew and output fell. It was not until 1997 until the economy stopped declining. This economic liberation did not work because Soviet industry had been highly monopolized and strongly titled toward military goods. Production of many items had been concentrated in one or two gigantic factories. Powerful managers and bureaucrats forced Yeltsin's government to hand out enormous subsidies and credits to reinforce the positions of big firms. Overall, enterprise directors and politicians succeeded in eliminating worker ownership and converted large portions of previously state-owned industry into private property. Inflation and privatization brought a social revolution. A capitalist elite, managers, former officials, and financiers gained wealth and came out of privatization process with large shares of the old state's monopolies. While the elite was gaining wealth, the majority of the people lost a lot of money and were struggling to survive. This rapid economic decline in 1992 and 1993 and rising popular dissatisfaction encouraged the Russian parliament to oppose Yeltsin. He then decided to bring in tanks and crush the opposing Russian parliament in October 1993. He consolidated his power but failed to develop an effective representative government. Eastern Europe had a post-communist government that worked to replace states planning and socialism with market mechanism and private property. Also, there were revolutionary changes where some areas prospered and other areas declined. Capital cities such as Warsaw, Prague, and Budapest concentrated mainly on wealth, power, and opportunity. But when old industrial areas declined, there was an increase of crime and gangsterism in the streets. With high social costs, Market economies and freely elected governments in the 1990s was a difficult transition. There began a surge of nationalism, where people believed in popular sovereignty and national self-determination. In Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary were most successful with this ideology because they were successful at economic reconstruction. These countries further created new civic institutions, legal systems, and independent broadcasting networks that reinforced political freedom and national revival. Lech Walesha in Poland and Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia were elected presidents in their countries and both opposed communism. As a result, Czechoslovakia's Velvet Revolution in 1989, Havel and the parliament accepted a velvet divorce. As a result, the revolutions of 1989 accelerated the breakup of Yugoslavia. In June 1991, 
Slovenia and Croatia declared independence. Slovenia then repulsed a Serbian attack, but Milosevic's armies managed to take about 30% of Croatia. In 1992, civil war spread to Bosnia and Herzegovina, and in July 1995, Bosnian Serbs resulted in killing several thousands of civilians, which prompted NATO to bomb Bosnian Serbs. Also, the Albanian Muslims of Kosovo gained nothing from the Bosnian Agreement, so they further formed the Kosovo Liberation Army, or the KLA, to fight for their independence. In 1998, Serbian forces attacked the KLA, displacing 250,000 people within Kosovo, and began January 1998, Milosevic refused to withdraw Serbian armies and did not accept self-government. As a result, in March 1999, NATO began bombing Yugoslavia. The Single European Act of 1986 laid a framework for establishing a single market, adding the free movement of labor, capital, and services to the existing free trade. It went into effect 1993 while European Community was renamed European Union and French President Mitterrand and German Chancellor Helmut Kohl took the lead in pushing for a monetary union of European Union members. Negotiations led to the Maastricht Treaty which set strict financial criteria for joining the proposed monetary union with its single currency. Western European elite supported the treaty and believed that a monetary union would solve Europe's economic problems. However, many common people, leftist political parties, and nationalists opposed it because it created many rules and the common people were afraid they would be the ones funding it. When East and West Germany combined under Kohl's leadership in 1991, unity was again questioned. Although Kohl made great investments into his eastern provinces, factories closed, unemployment rose, and people were not unified. 